Welcome back everyone. In this video we're going to be going over more enols and enoates, but this time we're going to be going over some a specific reaction called deuterium exchange. So let's just jump right into it. So in the previous video we talked about the stability of the enoates. So this is that's going to be helpful for this topic. Now let's look at one carbonyl compound. So we have this compound. Now, enols and enoates are always in equilibrium with the original carbonyl compound in water. So if we put this in a, like a bunch of these molecules in water, you're going to see that there's an equilibrium between that and the enol and enoate versions. I'm just going to draw the enoate. Okay, and so we're going to have small amounts of them kind of reverting back and forth between each other. Okay, now that's important for deuterium exchange. So let's say we have this compound, and I add in, instead of let's say OH minus, I add the deuterium version, OD minus. And instead of having it with water, we're going to have the deuterium version, which is D2O. So what's that going to do? Well, it's going to, we have a base and we've seen from the previous video that we can deprotonate these carbonyls. So we're going to deprotonate it kind of how we've been doing before, or we can resonate to the oxygen since that's the most stable spot. We have H's here and H's here. Those can all resonate to the O, as we've seen before, that the one right next to it can resonate next to the carbonyl. But these over here are too far. If we try to deprotonate one of them, we would be left with the negative here. But if we tried to get it to the O, let's say if we try to form a double bond there, that is an sp3 carbon. It's got a full octet, and I can't move anything, can't resonate anything to make sure that the octet doesn't break. So there's no resonance there. So those hydrogens won't work. Same if we pick the ones on the opposite side, and same problem for the ones underneath. So we're going to be looking just at the top four. So what's going to happen? Well, the first thing that happens is we're going to deprotonate this. The bond drops, and we resonate up. That is our enolate. Now, again, like I said, these things are in equilibrium with each other. We usually only add a small amount of base. It's called a catalytic amount. So we form a little bit of this enolate. But these enolates are usually not the predominant form in water. And so it's going to want to revert back. So it's going to drop this O- minus back down. And this double bond is going to have to go somewhere. And what is it going to do? It's going to reach out and grab another H. But we don't have any hydrogens right now. Because instead of it being in water, we're in the deuterium version of water, so D2O. So it's going to go ahead and grab a deuterium. Remember, deuterium acts basically exactly like H. So. If you just treat it like an H, it works the same. And so I have the D now instead of where the H used to be. The question is, is that the end of it? And that's the thing. Once we're here, there's nothing stopping this from happening again. And the, the idea is that this is going to keep on happening until all the acidic hydrogens are replaced. So let's run through one more time. We have our OD minus, 
and it's going to take one of those acidic H's that can resonate to the O. So let's say it just takes that H and our enolate forms. And again, enolates are not the predominant form of a carbonyl in equilibrium, and so they're going to revert back to the carbonyl. And it's going to do so by grabbing another deuterium. And now we now have two deuteriums where the H's were. And this is going to repeat again for those other two hydrogens to leave us with this in the end. All the acidic hydrogens will be replaced. That's the idea. These spots, we saw the H's can't resonate there. They're not that acidic, and so they won't be replaced. So that will be our final product. Okay. Let's look at another example, slightly different. Same overall structure, but we're going to add something into it. We had a double bond into here now. And the question is, what is the final product of this deuterium exchange? Best trick, and let's actually change it. Let's do, let's do that. The best trick is to figure out all the acidic hydrogens. And what I mean by that is all the H's that when we deprotonate can lead to resonance to the O, to form the O minus. So easiest place to start is always these carbons, the ones right next to the carbonyl. There's a double bond there, so there's actually only one H now. The question is, is that an acidic H? Well, if you remember a little shortcut, an H that is on a double bonded carbon is never acidic. And so that is not one of the acidic hydrogens. It will not be replaced. So that's one that's gone. How about over here? Well, if we grab the H, it can drop down and go to the O. So yeah, that one can be replaced. It is acidic because it can go to the O and resonate. So once we form our enolate, remember it's gonna go back into equilibrium with our carbonyl. And it's gonna grab a deuterium in the process. And what we're left with is that deuterium gets replaced. Just like that. Let's look at the other H's. So we have H's here. And that's kind of like the previous example. It can't resonate to the O, so those aren't going to get replaced. So we can skip those. And there's an H here. But our shortcut tells us that an H on a carbon that's got a double bond is not acidic, so that one can't be replaced. How about the methyl? If we draw these out and we see that one gets taken, let's say just temporarily put it on the carbon. The question is, can it resonate? Well, if it drops down here to form that double bond, Look at this carbon, too many bonds. I can't resonate anything to get rid of that. And I can't get it to the O. So not acidic either. So that carbon, the H's on that carbon won't get replaced either. The only place we haven't looked at is right here. Can those get replaced? Now, if you, you may think that they're too far, they're not gonna, get to the O, but always a good idea to try it. Let's say we get rid of one. 
So we're going to grab one of them. Let's think. Can it resonate here? Well, if it forms a double bond there, remember there's two H's here. That's an sp3 carbon. It can't resonate in that direction. I can't fix that octet. It's going to be too many bonds. So to the left is out. Well, how about to the right? If this goes here. It'll put a bond there. That's too many bonds on that carbon again. But I can remove that double bond away. I can move it up and there. So you can see structures like this that actually have more resonance than just going to the carbonyl and one, one carbon over. And what we're going to be left with is this. All right, now again, it's going to want to revert back, whereas this is going to drop down. This bond moves back to its original spot, and this one is going to grab a deuterium from D2O. And now we're going to be left with two, sorry, with another deuterium in that spot. And that H that's left can do the same thing, and in the end, we have that. That's all the acidic H is being replaced. Okay? So that's deuterium exchange using a base. How does it work? And we saw that we got enolates throughout. What if we did the same thing, but with acid? So let's say I used D plus with D2O. So we've seen a lot of enolates. This is going to show us what an enol looks like. So instead of a deprotonation happening, first, we're going to have a protonation or an acid. Just like you've seen before, if you think about this as an H, H plus, carbonyls like to grab H plus, so they'll like to grab the deuterium with the positive. It acts the same. So this is now going to be a protonated. carbonyl, and what happens now is that D2O, it's going to go after one of those acidic H's. This is the same as that first example, so it's going to be the H's that can still lead to, oh my bad, lead to resonance with that carbonyl. So these four, it'll grab one, drop down, fix that positive. And we're going to be left with that. Now again, that's going to want to revert. It doesn't want to stay in this enol form. And you can remember as an enol looks like an enolate, but the all implies it looks somewhat like an alcohol. So like that. That's just the deuterium version of an enol. So it's going to want to revert because this isn't the predominant form. It's going to drop down and form the carbonyl. And the way you can show that in one step, instead of going like this, you can think of it like the sum of like the arrows end up going like this. The overall step is starts from here, ends there. So your arrow should really just be like that to simplify it for yourself. Goes like this. That implies that this deuterium sort of falls off and that bond swings down like a door around the O to here. And this is gonna go out and now it's gonna just grab a deuterium from D2O. And what we're going to be left with is one of those H's is replaced 
with a D. So sort of the same exact end result as if we, if we use base. And this is going to keep going just like with base until all the acidic hydrogens are replaced. So if we can do this three more times. And we're going to just be left. With that, so in acid or base, the end result is the same. All acidic hydrogens will be replaced. If we had this structure and we used the acid version, we would still get the same exact answer. All right. And so that's deuterium exchange. Now, before we finish off this video, I want to talk one more about this whole equilibrium concept, just a little bit more. I mentioned that when we look at the enol or the enoate, there's always a small percentage of it in equilibrium with our carbonyl. That means we have a lot more of our original carbonyl um, in the solution than the enol. Okay, so if we kind of drew this out, or the enolate, so if we drew this out, if we threw a bunch of this ketone into a container, we would have this very small amount of this enol form naturally occurring, or enolate. And so the predominant form is really that carbonyl by a large amount, okay? Now, if we look at the be a beta dicarbonyl, so since we have a ketone at the top, I'll use a ketone here. And let's pretend we're in water for all of these. If we have a beta dicarbonyl. And we look at the enol version. That enol version is actually in a much, much greater amount than that enol version. If we put the same amount of this ketone and the beta dicarbonyl, there would be a lot more of that beta dicarbonyl enol version than of this enol. Why is that? Why is there so much more of this compound? than that enol at the top. Well, these beta dicarbonyl uh, compounds are much more acidic. That's one idea. All right, they're much more acidic. The H is much easier to take. And not only that, but if you look at that double bond, we're able to resonate across all the across all of here. We can have this take that H, this bond drop, and this come up. So we can switch this around. So our double bond is able to resonate around. There is conjugation here with the other carbonyl. So that's another thing that gives it more stability. And not only that, one unique thing here, one unique concept, is that the, the H of that enol is actually able to hydrogen bond to that carbonyl. That gives it some stability in the enol form that the carbonyl version does not have. That is why there's more of it. All of these factors contribute to the fact that comparing a regular monocarbonyl versus a beta dicarbonyl in, let's say, water, we have, if you compare the enol forms, the beta dicarbonyl are more prevalent than the monocarbonyl enol version. Okay? So, just wanted to talk a little bit about that 
equilibrium idea. All right, so I hope this video helped you guys. We went over the Ethereum exchange and some equilibrium concepts, and I will see you guys in the next video.